and he developed uh, during his work some sort of paralysis. It was like a bad case of arthritis, but he was paralyzed from his neck down. He couldn't move his hands, his feet. He dropped from 180 pounds down to about 80, and the doctor said, uh, we don't know anything we can do for you. You maybe have a couple of months. You can go somewhere and die where you're comfortable. Well, Tom turned to Edgar Casey. He came down to the beach. I helped carry Tom upstairs. He Lynn and I carried him upstairs at our house, and he stayed there and got readings, and he wrote There's a River after he recovered. He never did get so he could walk without crutches, but he did get well enough to go back to his job with the Herald Tribune and American Magazine. As a matter of fact, he made a trip to the Mideast after he went back to work. But uh, Tom had a chance to talk to Dad at great length while he was there taking these treatments. And uh, we talked to Tom, too. And so he had access, really, to the whole family. And uh, I, I think he did a good job on the book. The book came out, he became popular overnight. I mean, people uh, would call him on the phone at all hours of the night. My wife's dying, my daughter's dying, nobody can help her, won't you please do something? And Edgar Casey just couldn't say no. So normally he gave, at the most, two readings a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. It was a certain strain on him. I mean, it was a, a physical strain as well as a mental and emotional strain. But uh, when those requests came in, they piled up and he just couldn't say no to these people. He started giving three, four, five, six, eight, ten readings a day. It was too much for him, and he had a breakdown. And he had a reading on himself, and it just said that he was trying to do too much, that he had to slow down. If he didn't, it would kill him. He didn't slow down, and it killed him. Hugh Lynn didn't know Dad was dead for two months, and uh, he was with Patton's army running across Germany, and. Uh, I was down in Trinidad and uh, with a radar set, and uh, of course I heard about Dad's death, but there wasn't anything, uh, you know, that Hugh Lynn uh, could do, I could do. Edgar Casey died in his own bed in his home in Virginia Beach on the evening of January 3rd. Within an hour, the house was filled with friends. Edgar Casey was buried in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Three months later, his wife, Gertrude, was buried by his side. Gladys Davis saw it all. She knew it was coming. It was the vision that she had um, after Edgar's passing. And it, it, it was a vision in the night sky. And it was a, 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 she, she envisioned a dark night sky and a single star, a very bright star, appearing uh, in the heavens, which was Edgar's star. And then she pictured another star appearing, connected to the first by a single strand of light, and then a third star and a fourth star. And it, at the end of this vision, you had this wonderful canopy of stars, this, this celestial light, and she knew that the Edgar Casey legacy would live on. I think in many respects, this was the true birth of the work, the birth of the legacy, of Edgar Casey's legacy, because it was only after he died that the work moved out, moved out of Virginia Beach in, in a serious way, as it is now all over the world. <laughs>